All right, everybody, welcome to our Unit 1 video. Unit 1 is uh, about 12 to 16% of the AP test, as you can see here. Uh, there is sort of the Unit 0, which is the same as what we started with, supply and demand, elasticity, that sort of thing, last semester. We don't cover that this semester. Um, it's going to cover four chapters, but don't get too intimidated. There's not a ton of depth, and as you'll see from this video, we can get through them pretty quickly. So let's get going. All right, chapter 23 is just a real basic introduction to macro. So what we're really going to be talking about pretty heavily is the idea of GDP, okay? Uh, gross domestic product is a big deal. We've obviously got real and nominal. You kind of know that, that real GDP is corrected for changes in price, which are primarily inflation. Um, and then there's nominal GDP, which is just whatever it costs today. But I'm sure you know that your parents tell you stories about what things cost when they were growing up, and those numbers are really lower, right? So part of that is the idea of nominal prices, prices today versus prices yesterday. Today they're typically higher because of inflation. So inflation you see down here is a major topic, and then obviously employment. So since we're really looking at, at these big, wide things, that's what macroeconomics is all about. And just know that inflation is an increase in the overall level in prices. So when we have a situation where um, you know, you've got your typical supply and demand, and demand shifts to the right, that means that prices are going to rise because demand shifted. That is not inflation. Inflation is just when all prices go up as opposed to, you know, the price of a particular thing that becomes trendy and then people want it more and the price rises. So just keep that in mind. So um, another big thing that we're going to be looking at is the government. So can the government promote economic growth? If you pay attention to all the politicians, they seem to really believe that the, that the government can do all sorts of things with the economy, both good and bad. Believe it or not, that is not an open and shut question amongst economists. Economists don't necessarily agree that the government can really do anything pro or con. Um, but can the government make the economy grow? Can the government re reduce the severity of a recession? Uh, we're going to study monetary and fiscal policy um, to see if that works to mitigate recessions. And then we're going to look at trade-offs between inflation and unemployment. Um, then we're also going to talk about when the government announces that it's going to do something, is that different than if the government doesn't announce that it's going to do something? So lots of overarching topics. So um, modern economic growth is a wonder. There's just no doubt that our economy, especially since World War II, has uh, just created standards of living that are absolutely bonkers. Uh, this really began in the Industrial Revolution. The Economic growth prior to the Industrial Revolution basically was completely flat. There was no economic growth, for all intents and purposes, for hundreds of years. Then the, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution happens, and we get into this period of modern economic growth, which is not experienced by all countries. But essentially, some countries almost haven't even hit the Industrial Revolution yet, um, though we're starting to... to, to change a lot of that sort of stuff. But some are still heavily agrarian, massive poverty, that sort of thing. So here's some interesting uh, figures, OK? So we have the civilian unemployment rate in the United States. So obviously, it's a rate. These are percentages over here. And you see, you know, uh, typically during and immediately following the gray lines, which the gray lines indicate recession, that's when you have high unemployment rates. Um, and obviously, this was the Great Recession that you guys all remember, and our unemployment rate has been steadily falling for quite a long time, um, peaking out or bottoming out, I guess, uh, in this 4% neighborhood, which is basically about as low as it's been, um, you know, other than relatively brief periods of time in the late 70s or late, late 60s and in the, in the mid 50s. Uh, here is our real GDP. So gross domestic product in real, so it's in 2009 dollars and adjusted for inflation. So 1950s, our real GDP was 200 billion dollars uh, or 2 trillion dollars. Now we are up to almost 18 trillion dollars today. Our GDP growth rate, um, obviously, so this is, is going to be 
our growth rate per year. So um, when you've got these high numbers, that means that we are growing, in this case, at 12% back in, in the 50s in that post-war boom. As long as we're above the black line, though, the economy is growing. If When this line goes down, that just means that the economy isn't growing as fast. So here, the economy is growing at 10%. Here, the economy is growing at 2.5%. But it's still growing, right? The only, so when is it shrinking? Well, during this recession, uh, whoops, wow, hold on a second. During this recession, we have the economy actually shrinking. So it's getting smaller, and then it got smaller during the Great Recession as well. So from a global perspective here, you've got GDP per capita. This is in 2009. Um, so the United States is a pretty high GDP per capita. It's not the highest. There are other countries that are a little bit higher. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, it's pretty amazing. You look down at some of the less developed countries, what their GDP per capita is. It's much, 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 much lower. So saving and investment. So a lot of this has to do with, um, with how economies function. So we can either save our money which is really just buying future consumption. That's what saving is. So instead of buying present consumption, which is spending, we save and buy future consumption. Now we can invest as well. So saving and investment are different. There's financial investment, which is what we usually refer to when we say investment. That is the idea of like buying stocks and bonds and things like that. Typically, that's not what economists talk about, though. Economists talk about investment from the perspective of um, purchasing equipment or something that will allow a business to make more stuff. So buying raw materials, that kind of jazz, that is economic investment as economists define it. Uh, banks are going to be crucial in this, so understanding the roles of banking and financial institutions is very important in macroeconomics. Now, what do we do in the future? So when we look at how we're going to... Um, to talk about the economy, the first thing we keep in mind is that the future is uncertain. And um, our expectations are going to affect our investment. If we think the economy is going to be good in the future, then we will spend more today from the personal side because we're confident that we'll have a nice steady source of income so we can afford to spend today. From a business side, we'll be confident that, it's, that the spending uh, on stuff will allow us to sell more stuff in the future. Now, if, we, if our expectations are bad that the economy is not going to be good, then we're going to save. We'll save for a rainy day. Now, we can either be surprised by these changes or we can anticipate them. If we're surprised, then we call these shocks. And we have shocks on both the demand side and the supply side. Let's take a look at that. So demand shocks are what we're going to talk about mostly. And it comes down to uh, primarily to, to prices. Are our prices flexible or are our prices sticky? Um, and if, there's, um, if we have flexible prices, then the price will fall when demand is low, but sales will remain unchanged. We're going to sell the same amount of stuff. It's just a matter of what we're going to sell it for. Okay. Now, if prices are sticky, then, meaning that prices don't change, then we're going to sell fewer things when demand goes down. So let's look and see what that looks like graphically. So here we have uh, flexible prices. So you'll notice that in this example, we have uh, a fixed number of cars that we're going to sell per week. But depending on demand, uh, if, the, if we're a DM, then we're going to sell 900 cars for $37,000 each. If demand rises up to DH, then we're going to be selling for $40,000 each because we're still selling 900 cars. And if demand falls, then we'll still sell 900, but for 35,000. Now let's look instead at flexible, uh, at fixed prices rather. So we're gonna sell cars for $37,000 no matter what. So when cars uh, become in higher demand, right? Maybe gas prices go down or you know something like that, then all of a sudden people are gonna wanna buy more cars. If the price does not change, then manufacturers are going to have to have more cars to sell. And then the opposite is true, too. When demand falls, if the price doesn't go down, then we'll just sell fewer cars. 
So you can see that there are different kinds of price stickiness, different levels of stickiness. Uh, gasoline, obviously, prices are very unsticky. They change all the time as opposed, as opposed to things like, you know, coin-operated laundry, obviously, to change how many quarters it, you know, the laundry machine accepts takes a, a whole bunch of change uh, to the machine itself, and that's expensive and difficult. So they really don't change prices very often. All right, so um, economists don't really agree with how sticky prices are, um, and our different economic theories are going to base largely on this idea of sticky prices and whether they're sticky and how sticky they are and how long it takes them to change and all that sort of stuff. But most of the time we're going to agree that in the short run prices are pretty sticky. In the long run prices are pretty flexible. Firms can adjust if they're given time. Now inventory management has obviously made prices um, be able to be a little bit stickier because it's so much easier to track and, and use computers to figure out exactly how much stuff you've got. So you can read through this, pause if you need to. And that will finish us up for chapter 23. We'll do the next video with chapter 24. Thanks, folks.